Hi, welcome to my ECG video blog. I'm Ken Grauer, and this is my fifth ECG video blog, which is part two on a clinical approach to cardiac arrhythmias. My goal is to continue from where I left off in ECG blog number 98 with an overview on arrhythmias from a primary care perspective. I will once again draw your attention to the webpage I've made that lists key links to my ECG blog, my video blogs, and to some extra downloads on the subject of arrhythmia diagnosis and management, as well as to links to my introductory and advanced books and EPUBs on ECG interpretation. Above all is my email address. Please write me with your comments, feedback, and questions. On to today's topic. In part one of this video, I focused on assessment of the patient. Is the patient aware of the arrhythmia that you see on the monitor? More than aware, is the patient symptomatic? Arrhythmias are common. Symptoms are common. But what we really need to concern ourselves with is whether the patient has an arrhythmia that can benefit from intervention. And, practically speaking, the only two ways to benefit are, one, by intervention that makes the patient feel better, or two, by intervention that makes the patient live longer. That's it. This simple truism has been more helpful to me in managing patients with arrhythmias than any other clinical wisdom. It's hard to make an asymptomatic patient feel better. So the only reason to treat patients without symptoms would be if intervention can improve outcome. And the key from a primary care perspective is determining if the rhythm is likely to be benign or if there are red flags that signal a need for further evaluation and or referral. We emphasized in part one the key issues of whether there is underlying heart disease and if there is anything we can fix, such as ischemia, heart failure, electrolyte disturbance, use of substances such as caffeine, alcohol, over-the-counter sympathomimetics, or excessive anxiety or stress. In part two, we'll now look a bit closer at some specific arrhythmias. In part one, we limited discussion of early occurring ectopic beats to the isolated appearance of PACs, PJCs, or PVCs namely premature atrial, junctional, or ventricular contractions. On ECG, we can usually easily distinguish between these three forms of premature beats by noting that PACs and PJCs typically manifest a narrow QRS that is similar, if not identical, to normal sinus beats, whereas PVCs are wide and look very different from normal beats. PACs are preceded by a premature P wave that looks different than the normal sinus P wave. PJCs are much less common than PACs. They may be preceded by a negative P wave with a short PR interval or no P wave at all. In contrast, PVCs are early beats that are wide, look different, and are not preceded by any premature P wave. That said, we emphasized in part one that for practical purposes, it really doesn't matter clinically whether early beats are PACs, PJCs, or PVCs, because the approach to management is essentially the same. Things change when there are repetitive PVCs, which is two or more PVCs in a row. We call two PVCs in a row a ventricular couplet. Which brings us to the sustained ventricular arrhythmias. We begin with a few definitions. What's this? It's three PVCs in a row, which is defined as a ventricular salvo. The definition of VT, ventricular tachycardia, is a run of at least three or more PVCs in a row. What's this? Here we count more than three PVCs in a row. This run is best defined by the term NSVT, which stands for non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. We might ask, how long is this run of NSVT? The answer is that we have no idea of how long it is since the rhythm strip ends while the run is still going on. 
which leads to the clinical question of how to distinguish between NSVT versus sustained ventricular tachycardia. Given that consensus among experts is lacking, I prefer a practical answer to this question. If the run of VT is long enough to give me palpitations, then I call it sustained VT. That said, are we certain this rhythm is VT? This brings up a number of key points, some of which go beyond our time allotment on this video ECG. For more on this topic, please check out our supplementary material available for free download at www.fafpecg.com. What we can say is that the optimal way to describe the rhythm shown below is by saying that after two sinus beats, there is onset of a regular WCT, wide complex tachycardia, without further sign of atrial activity. Specifically, we see 13 beats of this regular wide rhythm at a rate of about 150 per minute before the rhythm strip ends. While true that we cannot completely rule out a supraventricular etiology for this regular wide rhythm, such as pre-existing bundle branch block or SVT with aberrant conduction, at least 80 to 90 percent of the regular WCT rhythms you will see when sinus P waves are absent will turn out to be VT. This goes up to well over 90% of regular WCT rhythms being VT if the patient is older than a young adult and has underlying heart disease. Therefore, we suggest describing the rhythm shown below as a regular WCT without sinus P waves. Realize that while possible this is supraventricular, we should call it VT until proven otherwise. Treat the patient accordingly. So how then do we treat sustained VT? The key points that we emphasize are, one, does the patient have underlying heart disease? And two, what is the clinical scenario? Because practically speaking, our management will depend upon answers to these two questions. For example, if the patient with VT is in cardiac arrest with no pulse, then treat as V-fib with immediate unsynchronized defibrillation. On the other hand, if the setting is cardiac arrest, but despite the rhythm seen below, the patient is hemodynamically stable, that is, alert and perfusing well with a reasonable systolic blood pressure, then you don't necessarily have to shock the patient at this time, which raises the question of for how long a patient may remain hemodynamically stable, alert or not, despite being in sustained VT. The answer is surprisingly long not only minutes, but sometimes hours or more. Treatment is by ACLS protocol. If the patient in VT is stable, you can try medications such as IV amiodarone. As long as you remain ready to cardiovert at any time if the patient becomes unstable. So the keys for sustained VT are, what is the clinical scenario? And is the patient hemodynamically stable? Consider this third scenario. The patient is a young adult who presents with this rhythm. There is no prior history of underlying heart disease. The patient is alert and completely stable despite being in this regular wide tachycardia seen here at a rate of 150 per minute. Typically, there is a catecholamine onset. By this I mean increased adrenaline from exertional activity or emotional stress often precipitates the rhythm. This is VT. Depending on the population studied, between 5 to 10 percent of all VT may be idiopathic, that is, VT occurring in the absence of underlying structural heart disease. There are a number of forms of idiopathic VT, the most common of which is RVOT, that is, right ventricular outflow tract ventricular tachycardia, followed by fascicular VT that is seen here. More on ECG recognition of idiopathic VT appears in our supplementary material. For now, we simply want you to appreciate that many idiopathic VTs are adenosine responsive, which is a major reason why adenosine is now recommended as a drug of first choice for regular Y tachycardias of uncertain etiology. This also explains why even if the rhythm converts to sinus following adenosine, that this in no way proves the rhythm was supraventricular, 
since 5 to 10% of VTs may respond to adenosine. Bottom line. These patients should be referred to your friendly electrophysiologist, but please be aware that VT may occur in otherwise healthy young adults who do not have underlying structural heart disease. Let's now take a look at the other extreme, bradycardia. We use the term bradycardia to refer to those rhythms in which the heart rate is less than 60 per minute. For example, this is a sinus rhythm, but the heart rate is slow. The rhythm looks fairly regular, but the R to R interval is a bit over six large boxes. Therefore, the heart rate is less than 50 per minute. Key question, is this example of sinus bradycardia abnormal? The answer is that it depends. It depends on the clinical situation. For example, if the patient is a healthy young adult, then this rhythm is probably normal, especially if the patient exercises regularly. On the other hand, if the patient is somewhat older and complaining of fatigue, then sinus bradycardia at a rate under 50 per minute is not a normal rhythm. So once again, clinical correlation is key. Let's focus for a minute on this second scenario which we see quite commonly in primary care. The patient is a 60 or 70 year old man or woman who presents to you in the office with a chief complaint of fatigue. The rhythm is sinus bradycardia at a slow rate. What should we think of first? You're correct if you're wondering what medications he or she is taking. So what are the drugs that we need to think about when a patient presents with bradycardia? The three most common drug-induced causes are a beta blocker, a calcium channel blocker, and digoxin. But which calcium channel blocker? They aren't all the same. Only verapamil and diltiazem slow heart rate. These are also the only calcium channel blockers that are negatively inotropic. All of the other calcium channel blockers are dihydropyridines, which are primarily vasodilating and, if anything, speed up heart rate. What if the patient is not taking any beta blocking or calcium channel blocking pills? Don't forget about eye drops. There are beta blocking eye drop formulations that are used for glaucoma with just enough systemic absorption to produce significant bradycardia in susceptible patients. Finally, consider other medications that may also slow heart rate, such as amiodarone, clonidine, and certain herbal preparations, which is why we always need to ask about all substances that the patient is taking, since patients don't always consider over-the-counter preparations as medication. So, once you have ruled out medication effect as the cause of bradycardia in your 60 to 70 year old patient with fatigue, we need to rule out ischemia, which could be chronic or recent. Is there any history suggesting the patient may have had an event in the not too distant past? This can be subtle, keeping in mind that up to one third of all infarcts may be silent or not associated with chest pain. Instead, recent onset of fatigue might be the only symptom. Finally, while not that common, onset of hypothyroidism in older patients may be subtle and account for bradycardia and fatigue, so getting a TSH should be part of the workup. If all this is negative, that is, your older patient with fatigue is not bradycardic because of medication effect, ischemia, or hypothyroidism, then the diagnosis most probably is SSS, or sick sinus syndrome. Which brings up the question of how to diagnose sick sinus syndrome. It's important to appreciate how common sick sinus syndrome is in older patients and that, that its onset and progression are often subtle and slowly developing over a period of years, if not over a decade or two. Sinus bradycardia, often with sinus arrhythmia, is commonly the first and only sign for many years. The rhythms you see with sick sinus are easy to remember if you think about what might happen if the sinus node becomes sick. There may be sinus pauses or longer pauses leading to sinus arrest. In addition to a sick SA node, the AV node may also be sick, leading to slowing of AV nodal escape rhythms. Many patients with sick sinus manifest tachybrady syndrome, in which fast rhythms, rapid AFib being the most common, alternate with slow rhythms. 
Because of abnormal SA node function, there is prolongation of sinus node recovery time, so the longest pauses often occur after a run of fast AFib. This leads to the key clinical question. What is the indication for pacing? The answer is symptomatic bradycardia. It's important to appreciate that symptomatic tachycardia is not an indication for pacing. That said, if the only way to control tachycardia, those episodes of fast AFib, is by drugs that then make the patient bradycardic, that is an indication for pacing. Keep in mind that patients with sick sinus may be more susceptible to the rate slowing effects of the AV nodal blocking drugs that are used. Once the patient has a permanent pacemaker, the pacer prevents excessive rate slowing, while medications can then be used more liberally to prevent excessive tachycardia. Which brings up the question of pauses. As primary care providers, you see the patient first. We need to know when the patient with sick sinus syndrome should be referred for permanent pacing. So these are the basics on pauses. Up to two seconds is okay. Pauses of 1.5 to 2.0 seconds are common and not of concern. A pause of 2.5 or more seconds is borderline and more than three seconds when accompanied by symptoms is indication for permanent pacing but the cardiologist needs documentation of pause duration. For example, how long is this pause? To answer, just count the boxes. The rhythm is sinus. We count a pause duration of 13 large boxes with one second equal to five large boxes, which makes a pause duration of 2.6 seconds or getting quite close to the duration needed to justify permanent pacing. We've reached the end of part two, in which we've covered ventricular tachycardia and bradycardia leading to sick sinus syndrome. All that remains in our brief primary care overview of arrhythmia management are the SVT rhythms, which we'll cover in part three coming shortly. Stay tuned. Until then, this is Ken Grauer saying goodbye for now. <laughs>